Leucine is one of the two amino acids that is strictly ketogenic as opposed to being glucogenic or both. Ketogenic means that when you break it down, you can get ketone bodies. So ketone bodies are basically things like acetoacetates that can be used as alternative energy sources or they can be used to make lipids. So we can think of ketogenic as being like lipid making, whereas glucogenic, that means that you could be used to make glucose which is blood sugar and so you might think okay so you eat amino acids that are ketogenic and then you either build up lipids or you might see the impression that oh you break down lipids because ketones are also the breakdown products of lipids and so if something is ketogenic you might think oh it's going to make it so that you're breaking down fat so those are kind of these like dietary myths and really it's a lot more complicated than that. The complicating factors start with the fact that metabolism, it's not like just like those pure pathways that you see drawn out in books. Instead, it's this complex interplay of different paths. You can think of it kind of like a complex subway system where different metabolic routes, so different paths for making and breaking molecules are like different, um, are di like different subway lines. And most of these lines can go in both directions because we can be both breaking down things, so catabolizing them and building up molecules, anabolizing using the same pathways um, a lot of the time. Now some of the routes that between the different stations, there might be like a delay or something. You can think of there being some sort of problem going one direction between the two routes. This is because some of the reactions are totally energetically unfavorable in one direction, so you have to take a detour. Speaking of detour, these routes are very, very interconnected. And so there's a lot of like transfer stations. So in the case of like a transfer station with metabolism, it would be like a shared chemical intermediate. So a lot of these, um, it, the intermediates in these pathways are going to be shared between the different pathways. So for example, in the process of making, breaking down a lipid, you get parts that you can then use for other things like building up sugars. So you might think, okay, so is there really a distinction between glucogenic and ketogenic? If you can use the parts of amino acids, even if you say they're ketogenic, we can use their parts for making sugars. So why is it ketogenic? And the deal has to do with what is like do you get a net benefit? Do you get a net gain of sugar? What happens in the case of a ketogenic amino acid is that you're making it in, you can make it into acetyl-CoA. Now acetyl-CoA can enter the tricarboxylic acid cycle. The tricarboxylic acid cycle is like the central hub, it's a like grand station for for the metabolism subway system. And so the tricarboxylic this um, TCA is also called the um, citric acid cycle or the Krebs cycle. Basically, it could be used to both make break down molecules to get reducing equivalents for oxidative phosphorylation, much more on this later, but basically you can use it as a way to take pyruvate, um, typically we're thinking about this as like taking pyruvate from glycolysis, so breakdown of sugars, we can take that pyruvate, um, decarboxylate it, um, and then put it into the citric acid cycle, and um, this is going to help us generate ATP from it. But it's also breaking down that pyruvate into smaller parts, um, and those smaller parts can then be used for other things. So one of those other things is to make glucose. And so if some molecule, if an amino acid, if when you break it down, it gives you a component of the TCA, then we call it glucogenic because it's giving you a component that can be then used to make glucose. Now I mentioned that pyruvate gets decarboxylated. It gets decarboxylated into acetyl-CoA. And acetyl-CoA, well we can get that from our um, breakdown products of ketogenic amino acids. So we can get acetyl-CoA um, from some of these ketogenic amino acids and that can enter the tricarboxylic acid cycle so you might think, okay, well now you're using it for, to make glucose. But the thing is, to, try, to enter the TCA, it has to build, it has to um, shack up with oxaloacetate. And pyruvate can be used to make oxaloacetate if you don't have oxaloacetate. But this ketogenic amino acids, acetyl-CoA, these can't be used to make that um, oxaloacetate. And so in order to get it into the pathway, you need to already have oxaloacetate present 
in that cycle. So if you're just using that cycle over and over to get the energy out of it, well then you have oxaloacetate there. But if you're siphoning away that oxaloacetate, such as to make glucose, well now you're not going to have oxaloacetate there. And so in order to actually be able to make glucose, you need to, um, or even to get energy, you need to have oxaloacetate in there. And if you don't have enough oxaloacetate in there, you can't get in. And so there's no net benefit of glucose if you're just using it for the cycling of the molecules to get the energy from. There's no net benefit of glucose. The glucose you can only get if you siphon off that oxaloacetate. Remember these pathways can go in multiple directions and we're thinking about like a transfer station. So you're going off in one direction rather than um, going off in another direction. And so if you're going off in that direction, you're kind of like taking that train car away. I don't know, the analogy is not perfect. So though these routes are technically interconnected, you're not getting a net benefit of glucose. And so we don't call leucine glucogenic, instead we call it ketogenic. So ketones, those things that leucine can be broken down into, um, these can also, these can serve a couple roles. So we often think about ketones as being the breakdown products of lipids, and this is where you get a lot of like the fad diet type of stuff um, being sold as like these fad diets. Um, but yeah, basically don't don't think that the ketogenic diet is just going to go make you burn a bunch of fat. Um, it's useful in a couple of specific medical situations, um, but not really just for a general dieting thing. And the best thing is to just eat a healthy mix of a healthy mix of foods. Um, and yeah, but anyway, not going into any dietary stuff. So don't ask me questions about that. I'm going back to those ketone things so. though. So these ketone bodies, um, basically what happens is that they can serve as a way that because you can get them from breaking down lipids, they can serve as a way for your lipid or to send energy from lipids throughout the body. Um, so lipids, these are like fats and oils and stuff. And so they're not going to trans, they're not going to just float around in your watery blood, but the ketone bodies, these are soluble, they're water soluble. So they can float around in your blood. And so what happens is that your body can convert, um, these lipids into these ketone bodies, which can then travel throughout the bloodstream to other cells that need energy. What can happen during periods of like fasting or intense exercise is that there's not enough oxaloacetate for that acetyl-CoA to get into the pathway in order to get broken down for energy or to be used to build other things. And so this, these ketone bodies would just like build up. And in fact, this build up can actually happen in cases where there's not enough oxaloacetate present such as if the there's not enough glucose or if the cells can't listen to the signal saying, okay, we'll let glucose in. So this is what happens in insulin with diabetes is that the cells either don't make enough insulin or they can't respond to insulin, um, which is a signal that's going to tell the cells to let in glucose. And then that glucose can be used to make pyruvate, which can make oxaloacetate, which could then be used to allow acetyl a to go into the cycle. If you don't have that oxaloacetate being regenerated, well now you can't get that acetyl-CoA in. And so if you're not allowing enough glucose in because your cells aren't making the signal, type 1 diabetes, or you're not listening to the signal, type 2 diabetes, this insulin signal to let in the sugar, then this can be a problem. My thing's even worse. There's like this opposite hormone of insulin, glucagon, which is going to basically tell the cells to start burning fat. Um, hey, we don't have enough glucose, so let's start burning some fat. Um, but then the, you can get into problems if you keep producing these ketone bodies, but they can't actually be used um, in, they can't enter the tricarboxylic acid cycle because you don't have enough oxaloacetate. Now what can happen is your body can compensate at least initially. So the liver can send out that, those ketone bodies throughout the bloodstream. And those ketone bodies can then travel to other cells where there's still enough of that oxaloacetate present, at least initially, in order for the cycling to continue. And to, so these ketone bodies can be used as an alternative energy source. What can happen though is if none of the cells have enough of that oxaloacetate, um, and so this can happen in the case of say the diabetes, where there's not enough sugar getting into the cells, there's not enough oxaloacetate, and so those cells, even if they receive the ketone bodies, they can't use them. And so what's going to happen instead is these ketone bodies are going to build up in a condition called ketosis. Um, and so ketoacidosis, this is a condition that can happen where the pH of the blood can kind of get messed up because these ketone bodies have these carboxylic acid groups. Um, and so it's carboxylic acid, think acid, think um, 
pH. Um, and so these are messing up your the pH, and this can be a big problem with diabetes. This can also lead to a characteristic like fruity odor to the person's like breath um, caused by, by the acetone in these other ketone bodies. But normally these ketone bodies are a helpful way for your liver to send these energy sources to other cells that need them or to send them to other cells in order to use them for building things like lipids or whatever. Um, because these ketone bodies are going to be water soluble, they're able to travel throughout the bloodstream, whereas just pure lipids, um, just pure fats and stuff, wouldn't be able to travel in your watery, um, throughout your watery bloodstream. But all of this is coming back to the idea that you can use all these pathways mostly for making or breaking and you can enter travel between these different pathways and nothing is really just strict pathways. It's really more like this interconnected network um, where these molecules, our bodies have basically made it so that we can use these common precursors to make different things because all of these molecules, no matter how different they may look, they build up of basically the same atoms, the same elements, the same carbons, hydrogens, oxygen, nitrogens. And so really we're just reusing these in different ways and piecing them together in different ways, like a Lego set that you might take apart and put build together in a bunch of different ways. Um, and so yeah, so metabolism is a lot more complicated than it seems, um, but this is the basic idea of glucogenic versus ketogenic, and let's look in a little more detail, as well as some other things about leucine. So the two amino acids that are strictly ketogenic are leucine and lysine. We'll talk about lysine in a later post, but today we're going to focus on leucine. This is the structure of leucine. Um, and so it looks a lot like valine, which we looked about at yesterday, except it has an extra carbon. Um, so if you think about valine as being like a V, leucine is more like an L with an extra, <laughs> with an extra branch or more like a kind of snake tongue. The effect of having this extra carbon linker kind of pushes the bulk away from the backbone, and this is going to make leucine more flexible. So though it's bigger than valine, it still allows more flexibility around the um, around the protein backbone because there's less clashing if you're trying to rotate things. So it's a little more flexible than valine. Um, both of them are what we classify as nonpolar. Um, so polarity of is basically how atoms, when they're sharing electrons to form bonds, these electrons are negatively charged and they're not necessarily shared fairly. Much more on this in other posts, but it can end up with, you can end up with having partially charged regions of various molecules. Um, a key example of a polar molecule is water. The oxygen sharing the hogged electrons, making it partly negative. Those hydrogens are left partly positive. You have partial positive, partial negative parts, and these stick together, and so water forms these networks. Now, if you just have carbons and hydrogens, like you see with valine and leucine, well, now you have a nonpolar molecule. You don't give the water any partial charges to hang out with, so things are going to be hydrophobic, and they're typically found away from water in the center of proteins, and much more on this in other posts. What leucine and valine also have in common is the fact that they're branched chain amino acids. Um, as is isoleucine. And you can see that these amino acids all have this branching structure in their side chain. And there are group of unique parts. Um, these branch chain amino acids are all going to have to go through a similar breakdown um, pathway involving this um, branch chain alpha keto acid dehydrogenase complex, which I'll talk about more um, in a later post. But they all go through this similar pathway and all these branch chains amino acids are also essential in the dietary sense, meaning that we our bodies can't make them ourselves. We need to get them pre-made in our food. Um, okay, and so we have this, when it comes to breaking them down, through that pathway, remember, although you're breaking them down through a similar pathway, you're starting with different precursors and therefore the things that you end up with are going to be different. So for example, in the case of leucine, what we're going to end up with is acetyl-CoA, um, which can be made into acetyl-CoA, which can then either enter the tricarboxylic acid cycle um, where it can be used to make energy or it can be used to make other parts that can then get siphoned off, or this acetyl-CoA, um, can be made converted into like acetoacyl-CoA and ketone bodies, which can then be used as these alternative energy sources or to, um, or this acetyl-CoA can be used to make lipids.
Um, and so there's these various fates for it. Now, if you look at these other branched chains of amino acids, so valine might look a lot like isoleucine, but you're ending up here with succinyl-CoA. Succinyl-CoA is going to be able to enter the tricarboxylic acid cycle, and so we call it glucogenic because it's making something that's in this tricarboxylic acid cycle that can then be used to generate oxaloacetate, which can be used to make glucose. We didn't call the leucine glucogenic though because although it makes this acetyl-CoA, this acetyl-CoA is not in this pathway already, um, whereas the succinyl-CoA is. Now you might get confused because, okay, well, some of these were classified as glucogenic, even though they're being, um, they're giving you pyruvate. Pyruvate is not on that cycle yet, right? But pyruvate can be used to make oxaloacetate, which is already in the cycle. So these things are going to be classified as glucogenic or both if they can also be used to make acetyl-CoA or acetyl-acetyl-CoA. Whereas if something is ketogenic or it's going to be used to make acetyl-CoA or acetyl-acetyl-CoA, and if it's strictly ketogenic, it could only be used to make these and not any of these other things or not pyruvate. You might see these sorts of reactions referred to as anaplerotic, where basically these are reactions that are regenerating those pathway intermediates so that you can keep siphoning things away from these um, cycles or from these pathways will still mean allowing those pathways to continue um, pretty much unimpeded. So you need to replace those things that you're taking out. And so we call these sorts of replenishing reactions anaplerotic. And so a key example is when you're making oxaloacetate from pyruvate in order to enter the tricarboxylic acid cycle. You're not getting a real gain. You're not gaining like energy from acetyl-CoA. You're not taking the acetyl-CoA through the pathway and getting all those benefits, um, but you are getting the benefit of allowing the cycling to continue. So in the case of valine, we see something that is glucogenic. With valine, we're getting the succinyl-CoA. And in the case of the leucine, we're seeing something that is ketogenic because we're making um, these acetyl-CoA and acetyl-acetyl-CoA. Now, what about the other branch chain amino acid? Now, we have isoleucine. Here we see it's both glucogenic and ketogenic because it can be used to make acetyl-CoA and succinyl-CoA. So it can be both. And so you can see that different amino acids are going to be um, classified as glucogenic or ketogenic um, depending on their breakdown products. And then these breakdown products, they're all though going into like the same central location. So this tricarboxylic acid cycle, which is like the central hub, um, which can be used for these various purposes, including for making energy. Um, so speaking of making energy, when we're talking about um, the tricarboxylic acid cycle, so remember this is the same as the Krebs cycle or the citric acid cycle. This is often talked about in the context of catabolism. So catabolism is the breaking down of molecules for energy and anabolism is the make, the building up of molecules. But remember that all these pathways are going to be interconnected. You can go different, you can go in different directions. You can combine up these pathways. And by focusing on having these common intermediates, your cells can make use of all these different molecules for making all sorts of other different molecules. Um, so the tricarboxylic acid cycle, although we might think about it in the context of making energy because it's going to allow us to generate um, these reducing equivalents, which I'll talk about in a second, which can then be used to cash in, cash in for ATP. You can also use the components from this TCA in order to go and siphon them off to build other things, but then you need to replace those components. And where the replacing the components doesn't happen, that's where we can get things like the ketoacidosis. Um, but so this tricarboxylic acid cycle, it might not look like it's that big of a deal. I mean, you're only getting two ATP or in some cases GTP, it depends on the cell type. But the really big cash out from a citric acid cycle in the terms of energy is that you're getting this NADH and this FADH2. Now these are going to be um, carrier electron carriers. And basically what they're going to do is they're going to carry electrons from the, um, from the citric acid cycle, from the molecules that enter there into the um, electron transport chain. Much more on this in other posts, but basically this electron transport chain, what it does is it passes electrons from one, um, from one molecule to another. 
And it does this in this controlled fashion where it's using the energy generated from those transfers in order to pump protons out of this mitochondrial matrix. So when we're talking about side, the um, glycolysis and all of this stuff, we're dealing with things that were happening in just the general interior of the cell. But when we're talking about the tricarboxylic acid cycle and we're talking about the electron transport chain, these are happening inside of mitochondria, which are these little membrane brown compartments inside of the cells. Um, these mitochondria have these like um, compartments within the mitochondria where they're able to kind of like, you can pump protons out into that compartment, build a high concentration of protons out there, which can then kind of act, um, which can then you have this funneling effect through this compound ATP synthase, this enzyme complex, that you then have this buildup kind of like a dam. Um, you have this hydrolytic um, kind of conversion where you then are using the, um, using the inflow of the protons, the force of that, to drive this motor to generate ATP. And so these electrons are being used to generate ATP. And these electrons are getting transferred with this FADH2 and this NADH. And you can get those from the tricarboxylic acid cycle, as well as being able to get these key metabolic intermediates that can be then used for other pathways. Um, and so glycolysis is one way that you can get this pyruvate, which can then give you um, the acetyl-CoA and this doxyl acetate. And so with glycolysis here, we're starting with sugar breakdown, but you can also have um, compounds enter at these various points. So remember you can transfer in from different pathways or different intermediate, these can be different, these can be intermediates from other breakdown processes. But in order to enter the tricarboxylic acid cycle, that pyruvate will first ask to get into the mitochondria so it can get shuttled into there. But the pyruvate then has to be converted into acetyl-CoA in order to enter the pathway. And remember acetyl-CoA, well, we can also get that from our, from our ketogenic amino acids. So we can get acetyl-CoA from the breakdown of leucine, say, and then this can enter the pathway. So what happens is acetyl-CoA is going to get oxidized um, basically, the carbons are going to be given off as CO2, and the energy from, from the molecule is going to be um, transferred those elect in the form of those electrons, which can then be used for the payout. But this acetyl-CoA, in order to make that from pyruvate, you have to go through this oxidative decarboxylation. Um, so basically, decarboxylation, you're using, you're losing this carboxyl group. Um, and so this is being lost as CO2. You're also generating an NADH because this is an oxidative process. And so oxidation is the loss of electrons or electron density. And so it's often, but not always accompanied by the loss of bonds to oxygen and or the gain of bonds to hydrogens and much more on this in other posts. Um, but in this case, we are losing, um, we are oxidizing oxidizing this group, um, and therefore we're losing an electron, and this electron is being transferred to NAD plus to make NADH. And then this acetyl-CoA can enter the cycle. Um, so elephant in the room, what is this CoA? So this CoA is basically this, this small molecule. It's made from, it's derived from vitamin P5, so panthothenite. Um, and basically what it, what's special about it is it has this thioester linkage. So it has this um, thio, when you see thio, that's referring to sulfur. And ester, that's where you have like a double bond to an oxygen, and then you have an oxygen, and then you have a carbon. But in the thioester, you have a sulfur instead of the oxygen. Why this matters is this is going to be highly reactive. And so you can use this acetyl-CoA, you can kind of swap this Co CoA part from one thing to another. And therefore CoA is often used in order to transfer um, carbon containing units. And one of these carbon containing units it transfers is going to be an acetyl group. And so this is an acetyl group. You have um, acetyl double bonded to an O, so we call it a carbonyl, and then you have a methyl group. So this is called an acetyl group. Um, and if you look at the structure of pyruvate, you can see that it's kind of like an acetyl group attached to a CO2. And so if you lose that CO2, well, now you're left with an acetyl group. And if you hook that up to a CoA, now you get acetyl-CoA. Another thing to mention about acetyl-CoA is that because you have that sulfur linkage and the sulfur linkage is going to be what's really important for this transfer. Sometimes you see the, you see the sulfur actually written out. So you'll see like, 
coa dash s or acetyl coa dot dash s or s coa um and this is just telling referring to the s being there and so sometimes you might see um that it'll be like sh and so this is just like the coa the normal coa solve you have an extra sulfur there it's just emphasizing the fact that there is a sulfur there so the sh would be like the spent form but then it could be regenerated the acetyl coa can be regenerated um by attaching it back to acetyl um coa and therefore we are losing that hydrogen so now you just have um coa s blah 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 or whatever um, so that's just a little technical um, technical naming things. And so you can get acetyl-CoA, however, from breaking down leucine. And then that acetyl-CoA can then be used to make ketone bodies. Or it can enter this tricarboxylic acid cycle. But remember, if it's entering this tricarboxylic acid cycle, in order to enter, it needs to join up with oxaloacetate. And in order to join up with oxaloacetate, there needs to be oxaloacetate present. So if you're using this oxaloacetate to make glucose, you're not going to have oxaloacetate present in this cycle. And therefore the acetyl-CoA is not going to be able to enter the cycle. And that's why you get things driven to the formation of the ketone bodies. So what are these ketone bodies that we're talking about? So a ketone is where you have a carbon double bonded to an oxygen with carbons on either side. The three ketone bodies um, acetyl that are commonly referred to, these are acetoacetate, beta hydroxybutyrate and acetone. Yeah, acetoacetate is kind of just like two of those acetyl CoA's if they lose the CoA and then they join together. Beta hydroxybutyrate is going to be a reduced form of acetoacetate. So you can see here in acetoacetate, we have this double bond to an oxygen from this carbon. And here we have a carbon bound single bond to an oxygen. So you're losing a bond to an oxygen um, and so therefore you are reducing this. So reduction is the gain of electrons or electron density. Um, basically oxygen is really electron hoggy. And so if you have fewer bonds to oxygen, this carbon is going to get to keep more of the electron density. Um, so it's kind of like gaining it compared to here. So we call this reduced. So beta hydroxybutyrate is going to be a reduced form of acetoacetate. And these can interconvert easily to acetoacetyl-CoA. Now, acetone is a spontaneous breakdown product of these, and it can't be as easily converted into this, but your liver can do it. These are going to be easier to convert back into acetyl-acetyl-CoA, um, and these ketone bodies can, um, can then inter be converted to acetyl-CoA, which can then enter the pathway to either get energy or if you have oxaloacetate, um, they can be used in order to make glucose. Um, alternatively, the acetyl-acetyl-CoA can be used to make lipids. In terms of the actual breakdown of leucine, it's going to, it starts off with the breakdown of all the amino acids is like a transfer of the amino group. Um, and this can happen with the help of alpha ketoglutarate, which is another one of those compounds that was in the tricarboxylic acid cycle. So you can see that there's a lot, there's a lot of interconnection between these pathways. And so um, speaking of interconnection, glutamate and alpha ketoglutarate um, these are off, these are used for like the transamination or of a bunch of different amino acids. Um, so basically you can swap that amino group off of any amino acid onto an alpha ketoglutarate, gives you glutamate and your alpha keto acid. Um, in the case of leucine, the alpha keto acid, what we're getting is going to be this alpha iso, alpha keto isocaproic acid, which then gets further processed um, to give you isovaleryl-CoA, which then gives you acetyl-CoA, 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 um, and various things. So you can see that there's a lot of steps going on in all these different things. And because metabolism is so interconnectedly um, linked, you can then be using these components for different things. So even though you see them drawn out in this nice pathway, um, you can also get, you can get a lot of detours and then the detours, though, are taking components away from the one pathway. And so there needs to be a lot of regulation in regarding which pathways are getting used when. So although these pathways often can be interconverted, one of the things that makes it so that like some processes are happening and others aren't is whether or not the machinery is accessible. So there are some pathways, for example, that are only happening in the liver because only the liver is making the enzymes or making those complexes that are needed in order to carry those out. So it's kind of like not all the stations, not all the lines are going to be accessible from all those different subway stations. Um, but 
the great thing about metabolism is that because you have all these oxygen, you have all these molecules made up of the same parts, there's often some way where you can recycle these different molecules into making whatever other molecule you want. Um, it just might not be very efficient. Um, you might not be able to do it in that exact location. Sometimes there are organisms that can carry out reactions that we can't. Um, and sometimes we can do things that they can't. Um, but it all has to do with having the right machinery to make those to make those things happen. And then it comes down to whether or not it's actually favorable to happen and whether or not it's what your body needs at a specific point in time. But bottom line is metabolism is really complicated and we can't just we can't just break it down into those simple um, binaries, the simple glucogenic, ketogenic or the simple um, eat this, you'll get fat, eat this, you'll get slim. It's really not that simple. And your body has a lot of different mechanisms in order to try to regulate what's going on. Um, and so be wary of any of those like bad diets that try to use biochemistry, um, like biochemistry concepts or fundamental ideas that at their basis have some validity. But when you think about it in the bigger context, they don't actually hold up. Um, and so, um, so just be wary of that. Um, and just eat a balanced diet. Um, okay, so some final notes about isoleucine is that it was first isolated in an impure state um, by Proust, who was trying to study why different types of cheese tasted different. Um, and then in 1820, Henry Brackenot, who was the same person who isolated glycine, he isolated leucine from um, hydrolysis, so breaking up with water of, white, of muscle fiber and wool. He called it leucine because um, loose leuc means white, um, and this was a white crystal, which I guess you could then give that name to a lot of different things because there are a lot of white crystals. But anyway, this is um, where we get the name leucine from. So remember that leucine is going to be nonpolar. It's going to be hydrophobic. It's a branch chain amino acid. It's got that branching. And it's going to be ketogenic. So remember, ketogenic means that it can be made broken down into acetyl CoA or acetoacetyl CoA. In the case of leucine, it can be broken. It can be made, used to make either. Um, and these compounds, um, these are leucine is one that of the two that is actually purely ketogenic because it can't be used to, to make directly a component of the citric acid cycle. Um, and so the citric acid cycle, we often think about it in terms of giving you like NADH and FADH2, these reducing um, these electron carriers that are then going to travel to the mitochondria into the electron transport chain and give you a bunch of energy. But the TCA can also be used to make these metabolic intermediates that can be used for other things, including making glucose. So if you make, if something is broken down into a component of the TCA, well, then it can be used to make glucose and we call it glucogenic. Leucine cannot be used to make any of the components of the TCA or pyruvate, which counts because it can make oxalic acetate, which is in the TCA, but leucine can't make that either. Um, and so basically we call it strictly ketogenic. Um, later we'll see others that are going to be both ketogenic and um, glucogenic or glu just glucogenic. But in the case of leucine, it's just ketogenic. Um, but remember, all of these things are interconnected, and we just call it this because it's not directly making a component of the TCA, but that, um, but that um, leucine can make acetyl-CoA, which can enter the pathway. You just need to already have oxaloacetate present, and therefore you wouldn't be getting a net gain of glucose by using this. But once all of these compounds enter this pathway, your body doesn't care where they came from. They're all of the same. They're all made up of the same atoms. Um, and so really it's just that initial breakdown that is giving them um, different things, but then all of these is kind of mixed up and you have no idea where these atoms came from. Um, they could, and some of them came from like dinosaurs and stuff because these same atoms can get recycled over and over and used in different ways. Um, we just need ways to talk about them. Um, and so we can use them as different terms and classify them based on the pathways they take. Um, so hopefully that helped you understand why things are a lot more complicated than they might seem with those like flashing headlines and things like that. Um, but yeah, so hope this helps.